Hey there, I'm Tony DeCopel, and this is The Uplift, the show that lifts you up for the next 30 minutes, you and me as well. I hope you like our new look. We'll get straight to it. We begin with a 97-year-old woman who reclaimed the home that was taken from her family when she was only 12 years old. Here's Steve Hartman. <laughs> At the age of 97. Good morning. Just stepping out of a 4x4 four four is a major accomplishment. But Opal Lee has taken much greater strides than this, with no plans to sit anytime soon. Where do we go from here? We don't have to sit around and wait for the Lord to come for us. In fact, he's going to have to catch me. <sighs> Opal Tell you. is a retired teacher and lifelong community activist in Fort Worth, Texas. She's mostly known for her successful campaign to make Juneteenth a national holiday. But what is lesser known is how that fire in her belly came to be. Back in 1939, when Opal was 12, her family moved into a house that stood right here in an all-white neighborhood. They'd lived here just five days when a mob showed up. What did the mob do to your house? They tore it asunder. They set stuff on fire. They did despicable things. The family moved away and moved on. They just wanted to forget the horror. Until eight decades later, when Opal Lee decided the time had come to remember it. So she looked up the address, found out the lot was still vacant and owned by the local chapter of Habitat for Humanity. CEO Gage Yeager took Opal's call. He listened to her story, but then told her she could not buy that property said, uh, well, we won't sell it to you, Opal, but we'll give it to you. There's no, no option for anything else. What did you think when you heard that? Ah, when I get happy, I want to do a holy dance, but the kids say I'm twerking, so I don't know what to do. <laughs> and she still hadn't heard the best news. How are you? Gage also offered to work with donors to put a house on her land for free. And so it'll be a three bedroom. Plans are done and he hopes to have it ready for Opal to move in by her 99th birthday. I want you to know that I've got a God who has been so good to me. I think if I ask, he'd let me have a couple of more years. <laughs> Request submitted. Fast track, fast track. Yeah. After losing her son, a woman from Baton Rouge found a sense of hope in an unexpected and an unlikely place, a stranger just five years old. Here's David Begnell. This is a story that captivated Baton Rouge, Louisiana, a funeral procession for a fallen officer. And along the route, a five-year-old girl holding a sign which read, thank you, Mr. Policeman. We all kind of saw her and said, look at her, she, she, had a, she was happy. She was like, I've been waiting for this to come and y'all are finally here and it just, gave me a sense of how much it, the community appreciated the sacrifice my son did. Vicki Melanson's son was Baton Rouge police detective Terry Melanson Jr. In 2005, he was shot and killed in the line of duty, 32 years old and engaged to be married. He had a lot of empathy for um, other people. About a year after Terry died, Vicky got a chance to meet that little girl. What would happen next would change their lives. Stick out. Go have lunch again. That little girl is now 24. Her name is Madeline Jaro. And since they met, she and Vicky have bonded. I graduated high school. She was there. I graduated college. They were there. I got engaged. She was there. I got married. She was there. Every big event, um, I mean, literally, Vince, she was, she's always been there. Have you wondered why? I don't question it. I think it's just Terry and God knew that we needed each other in our lives, and it's just, we are. But wait, it gets better. Madeline chose to follow in Terry's footsteps. Meet Deputy Madeline Jaro of the East Baton Rouge Parish Sheriff's Office one of the newest Police Academy graduates. I'm so proud of you, I'm so proud of you. 
And I feel like my purpose is to carry on what he left behind. Oh, I'm sorry. In his four years on the force, Terry's mother says he would often ask people, what is your purpose? He wanted to reach those people that, um, that needed help. My graduation mm-hmm. from LSU. In the years before the police academy, Madeline graduated college. And look what she wrote on her graduation cap. What's your purpose? And guess who showed up for her? Terry died, and that wasn't the end. There was something way bigger. Mm -hmm. And we have Madeline here that is carrying that forward. And I know that that it's a God thing. I can't thank you or Mr. Terry or Terry Jr. enough for putting you in my life, you know, or or God. um, You're a blessing to me. You're a blessing to me. I have no doubt that you were chosen for this. Mm -hmm. You were chosen for this. Bound by tragedy, they are now purposefully united. You can do this. You got it. I love you. I love you. Oh, and one more thing. When Madeline called Vicky to invite her to the police academy graduation recently. She said, I'm graduating January 9th. And I said, really? I said, um, that's Terry's birthday. And she oh. said, <laughs> yeah. uh, I knew he'd be there. And I said, yep. Mm-hmm. Coming up, meet the restaurant owner using her business to give people a second chance. A restaurant owner in Northern California is using her business to help others by hiring people who need a second chance. Here's CBS Sacramento's Hunter Swords. From behind bars. To behind the stove, one restaurant owner in Placer County. We are putting labels on people. Oh, he's an ex-con, blah, blah. Is looking past the stigma. You have to work behind the labels and give people a chance because you would actually never know. Serving up opportunity. This is something that is extremely positive. It's thanks to the culinary arts program through the Placer County Sheriff's Office. When they do go out and get a job and aren't committing crimes that cause them to come back into our custody. The program already graduated 43 inmates. Hey, how you doing? Thomas is one of those success stories. All good, man. Not only graduating, but landing and keeping a job. I'm just blessed to be here. Something he wasn't sure was possible. They um, give everybody that was, um, that couldn't really maintain with life a chance, a real good chance and uh, to change your life around. Thomas is punctual, respectful, he's trying. Catherine is the perfect person to help. Immigrating from Germany, she once worked in a maximum security prison. If people just treat you as a criminal, you will never get back on track. Using an award-winning recipe of faith, hope, and a whole lot of support. I don't care if they made a mistake in the past. She knows just how far a clean slate can get you. You can teach everything. But you cannot teach attitude. What I want is people with the right attitude. And that's what Thomas has. A program that started behind the bars of a jail cell. I think this is how we get people back on track. Cooking up much more than just good food. We go now to a five-year-old's birthday party where the guest of honor had a powerful reunion with the people who saved his life. Here's Tom Waite from CBS Los Angeles. Some very special guests for Daniel Berrigan's fifth birthday. While this might look like an emergency call, no one had to call 911, at least not this time. But one year ago, a member of this paramedic team helped rescue Daniel from a rollover crash. Today, they were reunited. Daniel loved every second of it. I feel great. 
Daniel's grandmother was driving the car when the accident happened. Daniel's birthday has special meaning now, and seeing the crew that helped save her family was a powerful moment. It means a lot. If it wasn't for Flack coming, Falk. Falk <laughs> coming by and rescuing me and my grandkids, I don't know. You guys are just a blessing in disguise, and, and I'm just very grateful for this day and that everything's okay. Daniel got even more surprise hero guests from the fire department and the sheriff's department, all coming to show a little boy that heroes never forget their new friends. He's loving it until he thought he had to go in in the ambulance. Neither him nor Ava nor I want to get in there. Today's super important for us because we're part of this community and we get to do something for a member of the community who we, we helped once for a few minutes, but uh, getting to, to actually see him and see the recovery that he's made is just fantastic. Coming up, another special birthday party. This one for a World War II veteran turning 100. Plus, we're going to introduce you to a woman focused on helping so-called red list dogs. What are those? We will explain after the break. We take you now to a 100th birthday party for a World War II veteran who shared his life story with his community and CBS Minnesota's Adam Del Rosso. There's no shortage of pictures. That's These really pictures awesome. are incredible. Or stories when you meet Lieutenant Jim Rasmussen. That's not a surprise when you're turning 100 years old. One of the things I'm most proud of, I think, is that I've got this far, I guess. I, you know, it's one of those things I never thought I would do, you know. Normally, when you celebrate something at 100th year, it's a memorial. The Twin Cities coming together to honor the Edina native who flew 32 missions with the Bloody 100th Bomb Group in the 8th Air Force during World War II. We were just crazy. I mean, we were nuts because we were so thankful that you finally came and you rescued us. Well, that's wonderful. Yeah, and I want to thank you for that. <clears throat> His passion to serve starting as young as 17. My parents wouldn't sign for me because uh, they said you all got six months left to go to high school. A friend asked me to, when I finished high school, a friend asked me to go to work with him and so we worked for about a year and then, then the president sent me an invitation and uh, I joined up with the rest of them at that time. The squad even getting a nod from Hollywood in the new series Masters of the Air. This time the, the clouds were so thick when we were flying around in there. And when you'd see a shadow kind of go flashing by you, you'd think, whoops, that was an airplane, you know. So, and a couple of different times that happened, it really scared you when you see that, that other plane that came back that close to you. All these years later, his sense of humor and adventure not slowing down one bit. And I told him that, well, parachuting was on my bucket list, and uh, they said, well, come on over to England, we'll sign, sign you up for a buddy jump. And I had my advisor standing there going like this, you know. But everyone in the room giving more than a thumbs up for Jim's bravery and service. He's one of a rare breed of a, of a few left. Men like that um, need to be remembered because they're the, they represent the best of us. All right, at long last, it's time to introduce you to a woman focused on helping so-called red list dogs. What are they, you may ask? Amanda Starantino has the answer. Just a short time ago, this playful pup's life had an end date. Nala had 14 days until she would be euthanized. She was the sweetest, most friendly dog, and it's like, how could this dog be put down? Colleen and Larry Smith are dog people, but Nala is their first rescue. I was nervous about it because you don't know what you're gonna get. A lot of times dogs like Yogi here in the shelter just needed an advocate to support them to be able to find their forever home, and that's where Frost Fund comes in. And right now, California is the number one state in the United States with the highest kill rate at shelters. Brittany Scheffler is the mind and heart behind Frost Fund. We do our best here when we can to advocate for specific red-listed dogs at the Long Beach shelter. Frost Fund is a nonprofit organization providing education and advocacy for animals. One part of their mission is a focus on red-list dogs, dogs that need to be placed out of the shelter or they will be put down. They are not bad dogs. We do our best to relay that accurate information and to give these dogs who might not otherwise be seen that chance of really being pushed out. Frost Fund's Red List Rescue Team makes these dog stories go viral and hopes the right person sees it. It's simply a group of people who just share Frost Fund's Instagram posts. And this method, it's working. Since Frost Fund started doing this last year, 
13 dogs have been saved. One of those dogs was a dog named Snickerdoodle. Now we know her as Nala. She'd been found as a stray and taken to a shelter to be adopted and let loose again, then adopted by an elderly couple who surrendered her, leading Nala to be on the red list status. When Larry saw her post, though, the couple connected with Frost Fund and they had Scheffler assist with the entire adoption process. Just gives you kiss after kiss after kiss, kind of like a thank you for taking me. Saving Nala's life and changing theirs. Match brought to them by a higher power. Hear their love story after the break. We end the show with a couple who met on a dating app and soon learned that they have truly amazing similarities right down to where and when they were born. Here's Caitlin O'Kane. Millions of people turn to dating apps to look for love, but what this Minnesota couple found was more like an against all odds match. We both had the dating app hinge, then we matched and we started um, talking right away. Elizabeth started asking the typical get to know you questions, but the answers Joshua gave her were surprising. Because she asked where I'd grown up, and I said, you know, I grew up in Andover and went to Northside Christian School. And she's like, no kidding, I went there too in kindergarten. And then, you know, we put it together, we graduated the same year, so we're like, well, maybe we were in the same kindergarten class. Elizabeth found their class photo, and sure enough, Joshua was there with her. But that's not where their similarities ended. Elizabeth was born on September 13th, 1988. So was Joshua. Elizabeth was born at Mercy Hospital. So was Joshua. The pair were born at the same place on the same day, just six hours apart. The coincidences seemed too good to be true. But then... I remember calling my parents and telling them all about it. And I'm like, you're not going to believe this. And then I was asking my mom to pull out like old home videos. And we did actually find our kindergarten um, graduation <laughs> video. So we're both in there. And, and, and the crazy part is... Her mom zoomed in on me. Yeah. In in the video and then panned out and then zoomed back on Elizabeth. So it was like, we saw that, we're like, no way. The couple believes they were brought together divinely. We believe it was God and just all of our similarities, just how we're aligned with everything. In spite of the fact we could have had all these similarities, but you know, been complete polar opposites. And um, that's not the case at all. So I, I feel like, it was just a perfect match, and yeah, I think it was divine for sure. Just five months after they matched, Elizabeth and Joshua decided to tie the knot on September 13th, their 35th birthday. Our kindergarten teacher, we actually were able to hunt her down, and we mailed her an invite, and she showed up. And not only did she show up, she found a photo of us on track and field day together. They don't even remember each other from kindergarten. And against the dating app odds, they were brought together again. This whole divine intervention, as we, as we call it, um, has just really reaffirmed to me in, to continue to try to spread our story of hope and second chances. You know, we both um, had been divorced and had been in a, you know, dark period when we met. And that's usually when, you know, we've seen um, God really work in, in our lives is when you are down and you're in that vulnerable state and, um, you know, and then something happens and your course of your life has changed forever. So um, I'm just really grateful to him for bringing Joshua back into my life. and. Um, it's really fun to, to try to share that, um, that little bit of light to, to others. That is our show. I hope it brightened your day and lifted you up. I know it did for me. If it didn't for some reason, as I always like to say, reruns totally free. Go ahead and click that button. I'm going to go find some more good news. I'll see you next time. Hey there, I'm Tony DeCopel, and this is The Uplift, the show that lifts you up for at least the next 30 minutes, you and me as well. And we're going to begin with an NFL veteran who's been in the news quite a lot lately, not because he's going to the Super Bowl, but because he's got a very big personality. Here's CBS Philadelphia's Madeline Wright. You never know who you'll meet at a fast food drive through They were like, um, Danielle, uh, Kelsey's here. And I was like, no way. 
Danielle Bonham was working at the McDonald's in Brew Mall last summer when beloved Eagle Center and Haverford resident Jason Kelsey pulled up at the window. What was your reaction when you saw him at the drive-thru? So the first time, I cried because that's all I wanted for my birthday. I turned 40 in July. Since then, Bonham says she served Kelsey six more times. We know each other on a first name basis, obviously. Including Wednesday when he autographed her Eagles jersey. It's a photo that's blowing up on social media. I told him, I said, I finally got the jersey. Can you sign this for me? And he said, sure. And so he did. Um, and that's something I will cherish for the rest of my life. Bonham says Kelsey motivated her to keep going during one of the toughest moments of her life, a divorce. This was as bad as when I lost my mom in 2005, yes. Um, and I've expressed that to Jason. Um, it, the joy that he brings me, it's like it kind of feels the, fills the void. Bonham says Kelsey has left an indelible mark on the city of Philadelphia. If this is his last rodeo with us, I wish him all the best. And if he's got one more left in him, that's even better. While she's sad to hear he might be retiring, she believes it's not goodbye, just see you later. All right, we're going to take you now to a farm in Minnesota that has been the very same distinct color for 120 years. What's the story behind the shade they've chosen? Well, John Lawrenson takes us way out there to find out. Everything about being on the farm, everything is all day long, day and night. You never know what's going to happen. It's true. Sometimes Keith and Jane Tungan have to chase after a horse that gets out or deal with chickens who are a bit <laughs> broody. Yep, these girls are pretty friendly. But no matter what's happening on the farm, one thing always remains the same. One time, I believe it was probably Cupid Pink, we think. Nearly every day, we will find someone on the end of the driveway taking a picture. For the decades the Tungans have owned their farm, they've never had to give directions. Just look for the pink farm off of Highway 212. As we know, Keith, nothing screams rural Minnesota like Barbie Pink. Oh, absolutely. I agree 100%. The couple can't take credit for the color scheme. That goes to the Jackson family, who built the place in the early 1900s. Back then, it was the pink elephant in the room for the town of Broughton. And there was rumors in town that, that the, it was in the contract that it had to remain pink, which is not true. To be honest, nobody really knows why the color was chosen, but Keith and Jane are tickled to keep it going. Jane married into this, but she put her foot down on the house, which is gray with pink trim. If it was his choice, the house would be pink, everything would be pink. You can't buy pink siding. I've tried. I've tried buying pink steel for different buildings and pink vinyl, but you just can't, you can't get what we want. So every so often, everything gets a fresh coat of the Pepto-Bismol color. Yeah, you can see this is overdue. That includes the swing set, the lighthouse, the doghouse, even the dog herself has a pink collar. Occasionally, the Tungans even have to turn someone away who's interested in buying Mary Kay cosmetics. And in an ideal world, these guys would be pink as well. That's right. This just happens to be the 120th anniversary of when the farm was painted pink. And if Keith and Jane have it their way, it'll look like this for the next 120 years. We both absolutely love it when people drive up we can give them a little history. It is a tradition. No matter if it started out as ours or not, we love it. And here I thought the pink paint was just on sale at the hardware store. All right, coming up in just a moment, meet a social media influencer who's doing a lot more than sharing her life on the internets. She's making an impact. How? We will tell you. Plus, two mayors who are keeping their neighboring towns close-knit thanks to their own personal bond. Social media influencers. What they do is they often share their fashion, their makeup routines, but Brooke Eby's posts, they got a deeper meaning. Here's Caitlin O'Kane. Like many social media influencers, Brooke Eby chronicles her life online, from friends to dating and travel. But her influence has a bigger purpose, showing people what it's like to live with ALS, 
a progressive neurodegenerative disease that affects nerve cells in the brain and spinal cord. I was diagnosed with ALS in March of 2022. And when you get diagnosed, it's the most hopeless diagnosis. They tell you, you know, you're going to be fully paralyzed. You'll lose the ability to move, to talk, to swallow, and ultimately to breathe. Um, and the average lifespan after diagnosis is about two to five years. Like it's just sort of a depressing diagnosis. Despite the hopeless feeling, Brooke didn't give up. It took me a couple months after that of like shock and survival and just trying to understand what was happening to me um, before I could kind of start finding humor in it. That's always sort of been my defense mechanism is finding a joke and the heaviest of things. She had just started using a walker and was going to a wedding when she decided to find the fun in it. Like two hours into the night, we had people limboing under my walker. I was giving walker rides on the dance floor. And after that, I was like, okay, I can definitely laugh about this. If I'm able to make all these people at the wedding laugh and feel more comfortable talking to me about what was going on, then maybe I should bring it to a bigger scale. So she got a TikTok and posted about her ALS journey, informing others about the disease and letting those who have it feel seen. She shares extraordinary life events, like throwing out the first pitch at an Orioles game, and everyday challenges, like taking a train alone. I had a work trip and I was going by myself because it was kind of a last minute trip, so I didn't think to ask anyone to come with me. I just wanted to document each step of the way so that people knew what to expect, because that's what I had wished I had had before the trip was seeing someone take every single step and understanding like the little things, like even getting on and off the train. I'm like, how will I do that in a wheelchair? Um, so I just decided to document it. and. I think a lot of people loved seeing me zoom through the streets on my wheelchair because I was I was flying down the street and people were diving out of the way. Uh, but yeah, it's it's you know hopefully it helps people, but it also helps me as I do it. ALS typically progresses rapidly, but even if her condition worsens, her positivity never wanes. I think before I was diagnosed, I lived a very picture perfect life. Like I, I think my biggest stressor was work and climbing the corporate ladder and I, I didn't really have like a fulfilling purpose and then once I got diagnosed I'm like okay now I obviously have this challenge but now I also have something I can focus my energy on for good which sometimes you don't do that unless you're forced to like I don't know that I would have had you know as philanthropic of a life without being diagnosed myself. It's true. All right, we turn now to Meg Oliver, who takes us to New Jersey, where a pair of neighboring towns are staying close-knit, as they say, thanks to a very strong connection between their respective mayors. I'm in charge of Greenwich Township, also known as Gibbstown, New Jersey. Over here. Yeah, over here, to my left. And you? Paulsburg, New Jersey, to our right. Uh, uh, to our right. Meet the Giovanniti brothers, newly elected mayors of neighboring towns in South Jersey. Hey, hey John. Brother. What's up? This is the first term for John and the second for Vince. Growing up in a family of seven kids, they're used to sharing. <laughs> what was it like sharing a bedroom with three brothers? Oh, what time was crazy. <laughs> oh my God. Both Democrats now sharing the same job title. We're just a real nice, classic American town. The towns are intertwined. We go to their church, and so it's all connected in a positive way. The sons of a local butcher and homemaker saw their family support the community. Whether it's a church, a senior citizens club, and I think when you're growing up, you see that community service, and you feel like, well, that's part of what we're taught, and we have to do it. My three favorites over here. That spirit of brotherly love is what they hope to give back to these two tiny towns. Which town is better? <laughs> it's time. <laughs> yeah, it's a time. Yeah, yeah. It's my love. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What does it mean to you? It's special. I think it's real special for our families, for our dad and relatives in heaven are sitting watching us. They would be proud of us. Thank you, Meg. Coming up in a moment, the competitors at the World Snow Sculpting Championships. Yep, they're giving out trophies, including a team from Mexico that, as you may know, can't practice at home. No snow where they are. Guess why? It's too far south.
Here's one you haven't heard before, a snow sculpting competition in Minnesota drew teams from as far away as Mexico, where, as you may know, there's no snow. Here's CBS Minnesota's Kirsten Mitchell. We're making two horses, two chubby horses. It may not look like much yet, but Team Mexican Snow is working hard. We train all year long just to be in shape to, to do this kind of work. Carving their vision to life. Inside is Mexico right now, but outside this is Minnesota. So you're sweating? Yes. <laughs> they came all the way from Mexico to compete in the World Snow Sculpting Championship in Stillwater. There is not possible to practice in Mexico because we don't have snow in the city we live in. So every year is like a practice for us. The 12 teams have 64 hours to carve their masterpieces before a winner is named. This sparsely snowy winter created challenges, but they were solved thanks to snowmaking crews from Afton Alps. This is like the only place you can find snow in Minnesota. The cold delivered too. He's been sitting here just like a little gem, so. Besides the feet, he's good. Last year we had to plow the park. There was so much snow. This year we didn't have that problem. The Chamber of Commerce says last year's event drew 50,000 people to Stillwater. It's wonderful for the businesses to have such an event um, in first quarter when it's generally a little quieter. You know, Christmas is done, the holidays are done. A chance to share cultures and a love for snow. I like Stillwater because people are so kind and the nature is beautiful, the river and the bridge at the uh, buildings. It's impressive that everybody's from all over yeah. the world. It really is putting Minnesota on the map and we're really, really happy that we are able to do this. Not bad, not bad at all. To our next story, a once forgotten part of a Texas elementary school has been refurbished as a tool to help students learn. What is it? Here's Nicole Nielsen from CBS Texas. Each morning, way before the sun comes up. Music fills the halls at Brantsford Elementary School. I just love that we were able to take something that was just kind of sitting around collecting dust and using it for a purpose. What was a rusty old donated piano sitting untouched for years? It was just kind of sitting here and we thought we either need to use it or get rid of it and so we decided to use it now refreshed their morning arrival. I feel very um, good because I'm making other people happy. Students rush inside and huddle around its ivory keys. The idea to refurbish and use the piano came from one of the school's teachers. As an arts integration school, music is a building block of their curriculum. They even have a class dedicated to piano, which means their day-to-day -day is infused with music and creativity. Very exciting to see our students have that, um, that confidence and the um, excitement to be able to perform for their peers. The students play the old piano on a rotating basis, giving everyone a chance to listen and appreciate. Not only the sounds of the instrument, but the beauty of turning old to new. Music is calm and beautiful. I like it. I like it a lot. Coming up, we take you behind the scenes at one of Britain's fastest growing TV channels, run by a father-daughter duo out of a home in the beautiful English countryside. Yep, you heard that right. Stick around to find out more. We go now to the English countryside where a father-daughter duo are running a TV station from home. Here's Haley Ott. Nestled in the English countryside is the unlikely headquarters of one of the UK's top growing TV channels. Hello, renowned Talking Pictures. Talking Pictures, run by 74-year-old Noel Cronin and his daughter Sarah, is a cult success, airing classic TV shows and movies famous detectives, Smugglers never sleep, epic right? adventures, might get drunk and, have a good time. and early science fiction from decades ago to millions of viewers across the UK. And if the content is vintage, so's the scheduling. So you're putting together a whole channel. How do you do that? Well, we do it the old-fashioned way, which is by paper and card. 
Does um, every film have a card? Every film has a card. But if you think looking backwards is bad for business, Capers. think again. A monster meteorite, and it's coming straight for us. A treasure trove of cinema history. Talking oh, Pictures me. launched on oh, Linear TV Vision in 2015 and has grown to be one of the biggest independent oh, channels in Britain. About four million people tune in a month, many of whom are older. It's a channel that is full of nostalgia. It's all about saving celluloid and film history and TV history. It's a community as well. You know, everybody that watches us has probably followed our journey and, and kind of feels part of our, our story. One big family we are. This family sends old reels of fragile film into Nolan Sarah, canisters and canisters, in case they contain a bit of cinematic history. And Noel investigates on his TV show, Footage Detectives, where he watches the films to find hidden gems. So can we do an investigation? Can we look at sure. something? Sure, pick a reel. On the day of our visit, we do our own bit of sleuthing. Okay, it's 16 mil. Um, it's spooled up and nicely on a reel. It's like suspense, oh my gosh. Ta -da. Yeah, roll the drums. Uh, we see it is a negative. Um, looks like a, train? a postman or a train driver. Yes, yeah, a train driver. So th this is already looking very interesting because it's trains. Although there's somebody making up there, so... Um, huh. Uh, What's interesting about it? Well, trains are always interesting because there's millions of people out there that, uh, that still love the steam train and... Uh, wait a minute, what is this? Uh, We're on to something. Of course, it's the wrong and way And then around. a twist. To flip that. I think maybe this is something rude. <laughs> it's an X-rated train oh film. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness, it is. <laughs> this is. Well, there you are, you see. Well, we've got to take that off. So that's, <laughs> that's one that's come in to us. Would you like to bring another one? <laughs> <laughs> maybe from the same lady? Well, maybe not. Maybe not. Yeah, maybe not. Mystery solved, sort of and viewers send in more than film to the little TV station's office. Letters, calls, and emails roll in. You have thank you notes all over your office. Your phone is ringing off the hook. You're very connected. Who are you talking to? What are you saying? What are they calling to talk to you about? Everything, really. Anything. <laughs> Anything from the, yeah. the bread stale to... Um, <laughs> a lot of people are lonely, this. and... You know, we are a comfort point, and we always answer everybody. Beyond its broadcast, Talking Pictures brings audiences together in real life, with sold-out screenings in retro movie theaters across the UK, turning back the years for viewers like former projectionist Harold Willis. This takes you back. Last week, for two days, I was 21 again. <laughs> I love it. You've tapped into this demographic of people that, do you think it was sort of underserved or underappreciated? Yeah, TV forgot about them, 100%. Mm. You know, my, our audience, they, they don't want to know about who's on a beach in a bikini snogging who. You know, what do they care? You know, they I want can't a, remember. <laughs> <laughs> they want a good drama. And, you know, and I think that's something we did really well in the 50s and 60s, good scripts, not all the time, uh, not all the time obviously, but good scripts, you know, really good editing, lighting where you're thinking about it, and a good story. Can you forgive your mother? A good story, like a father-daughter duo starting a channel for old movies and succeeding against the odds. Hi, I'm Nancy Chin, and this is the show that lifts you up for at least the next 30 minutes. We begin with a teacher who found a flaw with his fifth grade classroom and the man who helped him fix it. Here's Caitlin O'Kane. If you look around the classrooms at Taft Elementary in California, you might notice some of them have one flaw in common. They don't have any windows. That's true for Logan Ernest's fifth grade classroom. Most of the day, seven eighths of the day, they're inside. And um, you know they don't really get to see any trees, they don't get to see grass, the blue sky. We have these uh, wonderful beige walls and you know, it's, it, it can be a, a little, a little um, draining on them, I think. Former school psychologist Ernesto Rodriguez says the lack of windows is to blame because research shows being in and around nature eases anxiety and has benefits for students. There's 40 plus years of science that shows 
kids benefit by this emotionally, creatively, and academically. Rodriguez is no longer a psychologist, but perhaps he knows now more than ever the impact nature has on mental health because he became a park ranger on Southern California's Catalina Island, and he began focusing on his passion, landscape photography. He was out in the woods when he had his aha moment. He was going to bring nature into classrooms. I haven't been a school psychologist. You don't touch a teacher's walls. You do that and they cut your hand off, both of them. <laughs> so I thought, well, let's use the ceiling because you know they don't, they don't typically use a ceiling. And started developing a, uh, a catalog of, of images of trees. So when you walk into the classroom, it feels like you're sitting under a tree. And it has all those elements uh, of the science that helps, you know, calms you down, uh, helps you focus and communicate. He calls it nature in the classroom. He uses his photography skills to take 360 shots of tree canopies. Then he blows them up and installs them on classroom ceilings. He's worked with 10 school districts so far. We were there when he revealed the canopy to Mr. Ernest's fifth grade students. Beautiful. It is surprising to see because anytime you're inside of a school, you mostly don't see plants or like, or trees, but not surprising to see that there's trees here. I would say that's um, pretty like great and beautiful. I think the effects are gonna be more than just one thing. I think we're gonna have, I think my attendance is gonna go up. I think kids are gonna want to come in here more frequently. I think, um, Overall, I think the kids are going to be happier. And if you still don't believe in the science behind the art, Rodriguez says you can go outside and try it yourself. This is a marriage of both my career as a school psychologist and a, and a, and a photographer. And, and to be able to create imagery and spend time out in nature, uh, creating imagery that I know is going to help people is, is really a, a motivator. Coming up, did you know actor Daniel Kaluuya wrote his first play at age nine? Well, he recently put that writing talent to work in the kitchen and spoke to Anthony Mason about working behind the camera. Actor Daniel Kaluuya is known for films like Nope and Black Panther, but he recently stepped behind the camera and took on a whole new role. Here's Anthony Mason. Did you find directing more difficult than you thought it would be? Yes. Yeah. I didn't realize how present you have to be and how many decisions you have to make consistently. The film The Kitchen marks Daniel Kaluuya's debut as a director. Going through that for the first time must be, must be a lot. It's a lot. <laughs> but what a lesson, but what a lesson. No, 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 it's like, it's humbling. Kaluuya also co-wrote the screenplay. Set in a dystopian future London. So where do you live? Kitchen. The film follows a community that refuses to abandon its home, called the kitchen, to the police state. What was the biggest obstacle for you in terms of writing? Confidence. It's like you have this fear of being rubbish. Yeah. The realization is that you have to be rubbish. Like it's literally part of the process. You kind of, you're gonna get the first draft, it's gonna be rubbish yeah. and you just keep going. The pivot was, I'm not trying to be good or great, I'm trying to be honest. This is your neighborhood? Yeah, it's where I grew up. Kaluuya was raised by his Ugandan-born mother in London's Camden town. There you go. What's going on, you're up? Yeah, I'm good, bro. You kind of acted up in school, was that? Yeah, I acted up, that's why I did acting. <laughs> <laughs> The teacher told my mom, he's like, he acts up, he should act. You know, and my mom listened. <laughs> That's yeah. funny. You did improv as a kid? Yeah, yeah, improvisation. But you kept it secret. I didn't tell anyone. Why? Because it was my thing. Were you good at it, do you think? At the beginning, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I wasn't. I've probably been looking at the same damn cloud every day for the last six months. What I realized, acting is an interpretive art and writing and improv is a creative art. Yeah. So then I was writing on the spot. You know what I'm saying? So with improv, you're writing on the spot. Kaluuya had written his first play at age nine. <laughs> I wrote this play and I won a competition. It got performed at Hampshire Theatre. So it was a, yeah, it was a big, 
Yeah, it's it a massive moment. At 19, he wrote two episodes for the hit British TV series Skins, which he also starred in. Yeah, what, wait, one, one, right, you get me. <laughs> and two years later, acclaimed playwright Roy Williams cast Kaluuya in his boxing drama Sucker Punch in London. I can't be touched. I won't be touched. Which is kind of what opened everything up for you, really? It did, it did, it did. It was my first lead role. Ah, Simon. He then started landing film roles in Johnny English Reborn. Are you sure that's the ascender, sir? Yes, yes, I know it anyway. Agent in distress. Agent in distress. And Sicario. Talk to me when we can. I don't have any answers for you. Well, let's get some there. But Kaluuya quickly became disillusioned with the film industry. What was that all about? Um, racism. Uh, it's not even race, it is racism, but it's also just like kind of like um, people having power that don't really know what they're doing. Yeah. And so it's like they have governing the moves and what's happening, but it's not like the work is true or, or honest or pushing boundaries. And I just was like, why am I being led by people that don't, that, that don't inspire me? So then I said, all right, cool, I'm going to leave. And that's when you auditioned for Jordan Peele, right? Yes. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. How long have you known that guy? The director cast him in his psychological thriller, Get Out. And this is going to sound weird, but when he came at me, it felt like I knew him. He earned rave reviews and his first Oscar nomination. Wait, wait, wait. <laughs> kind of changed things. Changed my whole life, yeah. <laughs> it did change my whole life. But it was like, um, yeah, it changed my whole life. It's still happening. <laughs> Is that a good thing or a bad thing? It gets better with time. Does it? Yeah. I think I wasn't prepared. I don't think I chose it. I think I chose to make great work. I didn't, didn't really comprehend the repercussions of that yeah. in terms of my visibility and how people might be interested in my life. It led to roles in Black Panther, Bambi. Queen and Slim. What if they kill us? Don't say that. There's no guarantee they won't. And Judas and the Black Messiah. You can murder revolutionary, but you can't murder revolution. And you can murder a freedom fighter, but you can't murder freedom. His intense performance as Black Panther Party leader Fred Hampton hey, hey. Revolutionary. won him every major award including the Oscar for Best Supporting Actor. That win, Kaluuya says, is one of the reasons he got the green light to direct The Kitchen. So has this changed your feelings about acting in the sense of how much you want to do and how much directing you want to do? Yeah, I definitely want to do directing. All roads have been leading to this. They have. I've been in denial, essentially. I want to make soul movies. What's a soul movie? Something that moves you. Something that moves you, he says, like an infectious song. Does it make you dance? Do you feel it? Because you can't articulate why a song makes you dance. You just move. Yeah. It's just, that's it. That's what I want. In film, I want that. And that's what I want creatively. I, I believe I can do anything, anything. And so, and I just want to exercise that and then I'll die. Yeah. <laughs> Coming up, meet a hiker hoping to make history as she embarks on a cross country journey. Plus, a photographer who has captured the same subject nearly every day for the last four years. But no two photos are the same. We now introduce you to a photographer who has taken 100,000 photos of the same subject. And there's nothing repetitive about those images. Here's CBS San Francisco's Itai Hod. Step on to the Golden Gate Bridge on any given day, and you might just become the focus of Jake Ricker's six-year-long obsession. November 2017, I came out here one day, just by myself, just photographing, and then I never really left. A street photographer, he's been here every day, capturing life along this iconic landmark. Some days it's like a really, really sad day, and some days it's a really, really exciting and positive experience, and... I think that's what makes it so amazing. In the last four years, he says he's missed only 20 days, snapping an estimated 100,000 photos. Are there ever days where you don't want to be here? 
Yeah, I mean, all the time. I wish I could sleep in. I wish I could not be in cold fog and rain. He's here up to 10 hours a day. But unlike most people, his eye is not on the bridge itself, but on what's happening on it. You have one second to get it right. You can never duplicate that situation again. And when you get something out of that, I think it's way more magical than anything that can be captured in a studio. Over the years, he's witnessed everything from car crashes to protests to weddings and something else this span has sadly become famous for. There's been days where I've literally stopped or played a role in stopping three or four people from jumping in one day. Financially speaking, however, he's barely surviving, relying on savings and credit cards to fund his project. So far, he hasn't been able to monetize it. In the meantime, Jake says he's not going anywhere. If all my financial problems were solved, this is still what I would be doing. And while he has no idea whether his project will get the exposure it deserves, he'll cross that bridge when he comes to it. The American Discovery Trail is a massive hiking route that connects one side of the country to the other. CBS Sacramento's Marley Ginter caught up with a hiker on the trail, hoping to make history on the trek. Um, this is my sleeping pad. Brianna DeSanctis carries everything she needs to sleep, to eat. Put this on here and fill it up with some water. All tucked away on her back as she hikes across the entire country. I've hiked around 6,600 miles to get here. Brianna set out from Delaware, determined to be the first woman to complete the American Discovery Trail, a massive coast-to-coast -coast hiking and biking route. The trail is generally split into four regions, connecting California all the way to Washington, D.C. I have experienced some of the most amazing people, the nicest families, people that don't know me from a hole in the ground, inviting me into their house for dinner. From people to all sorts of wildlife, she's come across mountain lions, bears, prairie dogs. I've had one-on-one -on -one conversations with lots of livestock out here. And challenging weather from one extreme to the next. Go one day I was hiking and it went from 22 to about two degrees in probably 40 minutes. On the other end of things, I was in southern Illinois and the temperature was over 100 degrees for about a week. A hiker determined to go the distance. I think we're not being pushed enough and I definitely push myself on this one. Pushing herself in hopes to strengthen others. One of my biggest reasons for hiking this trail is to inspire others and to empower women. I think nowadays people don't really get outside enough. Coming up, David Begno is on another mission to find a story in a mystery city. This one nestled in the mountains. Any guesses? David Begno had a plane ticket to a surprise location and a mission to find a story. So where did he go and what did he find? A man helping others with wooden nickels. Where are we going? Where are we going? Tell me. Asheville, North Carolina. I have never been. Thank you. Let's go. This is going to be fun. It was a quick 56-minute flight from Atlanta to Asheville where the adventure began. Bye. This time in a city nestled in the Blue Ridge Mountains, best known for its vibrant art scene, diverse food, and 50-plus breweries. Are you here to do a story? Yeah. Where are you yeah. going to do it? I, I don't know. I have 48 hours to find it. Have oh, it's one of those. those? It's yes. one of those. To kick off the journey, we started at Asheville's most visited site, Biltmore Estate. There, my team surprised me with someone who knows the place pretty well. Welcome to Biltmore. I'm Chase Pickering. Hi, Chase. Pleasure yeah. to meet you. So glad to have you here today. This is quite a sight. Biltmore House was uh, built by my great-great-grandfather in 1895. George Vanderbilt was his name. It's the largest privately owned home in America. I could get accustomed to this. <laughs> Let's take a closer look. Chase took me on a private tour and shared what it was like growing up as a descendant of the family who built New York's famous Grand Central Terminal. I mean, the majesty of this, like, kind of gives me the chills. Isn't it spectacular? Wow. 
From here, it was time for breakfast. So we headed to a place called Biscuit Head, and I tried the filthy animal. So there's egg, pimento cheese, a biscuit, and bacon. I mean, what else do you say? One more bite, and I'm done. From here, we headed for Asheville's River Arts District, which has a vintage vinyl shop. Oh, I love this. And some individual art studios. This is really striking and beautiful. Thank you. We decided to pop into Asheville's Visitor Center nearby. Any ideas on things we should see? Or people we should meet, actually, people, more important. People you should meet. Yeah. They told me to check out the Tasty Diner and go meet the owner, Stephen Goff. Are you Mr. Goff? I'm David with CBS News. Hey, how are you? I'm good. We were told to come and check this place out. <laughs> Poor guy. He looked pretty confused. So I sat out and I told him this. I'm looking for just fascinating people. Cool. And stories that make you mad, sad, or glad. Any of the three work. I'm pretty sure I have all of them. Over a delicious Philly cheesesteak, he started to tell me about his past. And I knew real quickly we had found our story. You know, I was born in Northern California, and my family moved to South Carolina. My first year of high school, I dropped out and started hopping freight trains um, and hopped all around the country. How did you like that lifestyle? It was pretty cool. <laughs> I mean, you know, there's what a made lot, it cool? There's a lot of things, you know, for like a young person that was like just stuck in a super conservative southern city. It was like the most liberating freedom ever. So life on the run as a teen was more freeing and fun than life at home. You know, it was the early 90s, so like, you know, if you looked funny, you were gay. So lots of people would harass me for that. I'm not gay, and I also have nothing against anyone with any sexual preference, but them thinking I was gay caused large problems for me in the South in the early 90s. You know what I'm saying? I do. Um, I grew up gay in the South. I totally get it. <laughs> yeah. I got it. So it was an issue, you know, and it was like, I would rather live on the streets than put up with this. <laughs> now you're starting to speak my language, but I also see your eyes start to water. Oh, yeah, yeah. When I was younger, I was just like, that was awesome and fun. But as an adult, you're like, oh, you were running away from pain. <laughs> you know? And that's it. <laughs> that's it. You were running from pain. You know, at the same time, like, the life that gave me and what that instilled in my spirit mm -hmm. as a human being made me a better person as a whole. He found his purpose in the first place that really felt like home, the kitchen. Stephen worked his way up the ranks using a skill born out of pain, compassion. You know what I thought when I walked into this restaurant? A place where anybody feels welcome. That's exactly what I want you to feel. That's what I thought. I want it to feel like our city here, like Asheville. I want it to feel like you're walking into my head and you're getting a little piece of my history and personality just from the walls and the decor. Steven had an idea, the wooden nickel program. Here, a customer can spend an extra five bucks to buy one of these wooden nickels. When people who are hungry come by asking for free food, Steven feeds them and a wooden nickel gets used. As our time in Asheville with Stephen was coming to an end, I started thinking that life itself is just one wild train ride. As long as you can hang on, you might end up being dropped off <laughs> exactly where you're meant to be. Isn't it crazy how you go from a boy jumping trains trying to find himself to sitting down on CBS News and telling your story? <laughs> it's pretty cool. It is insane, in fact. <laughs> I've never thought uh, would be anything so <laughs> so it's 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 pretty cool to be able to like take care of our community and and have somebody just coming through town and, and recognize that well the community is what drove us to you <laughs> and I think it's because of how well you've taken care of them thank you so congratulations thank you <laughs>